Well, good morning. It is really good to be back with you this morning. I am beginning to understand more fully why Pastor Sean absolutely loves this church. And I'm not just buttering your toast this morning. I, I mean that quite sincerely. After a few weeks of being with you, it seems kind of cruel to me to then have to switch gears, so to speak. I had a prior engagement with First Baptist Dalton and a uh, wonderful congregation, uh, good folks there. Uh, but I uh, I've gotten to know you a little bit better, so it seems like starting all over again. So while we await Pastor Sean's return, I'm enjoying the, the privilege of being here. It doesn't hurt that you're closer by home, too. It feels like you're in my backyard. Dalton is not. Uh, I, when I was driving up to the church, I, I passed an exit sign for Bucky's. Y'all Have y'all heard of Bucky's? Okay, I've... I've read articles about it, and I thought, well, okay, why not? I'll try this on the way home. Folks, they're crazy in there. That doesn't make any sense to me. And I was woefully overdressed uh, in, in, in that environment. That's not a put down. It just, it just is. It's a whole different experience. So today I'm glad to be back here in Johns Creek uh, with you all as you are counting down the time when your pastor can be back with you. But in the meantime, you got me, and I'm looking forward to both today and the days ahead. I'll echo what Pastor Rhonda said. Happy Father's Day, not only to all the dads and the granddads, but many of you have served as father figures in some way or another. You've, you've stepped in the gap, and you've provided what was needed and necessary to a young life that was looking for direction. So happy Dad's Day to whomever that applies to. I hope it is a great day of, of celebrating with you. Well, if you've got your Bibles, I'll invite you to turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to do a few things differently this morning. We're going to kind of dance over some verses of Scripture and then have a more sustained reading beginning at verse 38. Now, if you don't have your Bibles or don't feel like following along, that's okay. Listen along. I'll try not to talk too fast, but linger around these words of Jesus as we walk this way. That is, we walk the way of Christ up the mountain and beyond. That is the great calling for all of us is to follow Jesus beyond the confines of our, of our normal spaces. So to, to kind of get into this, you need to know a little bit more about me, just a little bit more. You probably feel like you know too much as it is. I, I did not grow up Baptist. I grew up United Methodist. My folks are still devoted to the little country church and it's actually part of what's called a five-point charge, basically five little country churches that when I was growing up shared one preacher. So you didn't even have preaching Sunday every Sunday. You had some Sundays that were the preaching Sundays and other Sundays just Sunday school. It's a very simple church. Um, Bob, you're familiar with uh, Philadelphia United Methodist Church, uh, an upright piano uh, that my dad played, no organ, no choir, no worship bulletin. Basically, it was three hymns and the offering, the Apostles' Creed, and the preacher says a few words, and then we just call it a day. You know, that's kind of kind of how it worked. Now, in spite of it being a small country church, probably as much as a nod to just the tradition of Methodism, it was also, well, somewhat formal. I mean, we wore our best clothes on Sunday morning. I, boys would wear ties and ladies would wear dresses and such. Um, and the preacher would wear a robe and, um, you know, it was kind of kind of traditional. My dad had a tough time when I became a Baptist. I mean, that was like crossing a line. Now, he, he's still okay with it, but still a bit suspicious. Felt like that Baptists carry their Bibles everywhere they went, and they referred to each other as brother and sisters. He was never quite too sure what to make of those Baptists. My daddy was particularly suspicious of holiness preachers, which in the Wesleyan tradition means they just get excited, right? I mean, we're part of the frozen chosen. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Part of the frozen chosen here, but, but the holiness, well, that's something you got to be careful about. The thing is, I got a sneaking suspicion here that Jesus sounds more like a holiness preacher 
as he begins to unwind this. And by the way, Pastor Rhonda, I got a suspicion that you weren't raised in the frozen chosen. <laughs> You're going to love this. But think about this. I mean, Jesus is delivering a sermon, I don't think, in a pulpit robe and stole with a pipe organ in the background and everyone listening calmly. I think Jesus is stepping back, and particularly in this section that begins in verse 21, and he's letting it roar. Because you see, Jesus is an Old Testament pre preacher. He really is. In Matthew's gospel, there are more quotations from the Old Testament than any other gospel. And let's face it, the New Testament wasn't written at this time. So when Jesus is preaching, he's preaching from the Old Testament. You can't say, brothers and sisters, that you're a New Testament kind of believer. You got to be a Bible kind of believer that begins in the Old Testament. And so Jesus enters this sermon and he says, you have heard that it was said. Thank you, Rhonda. You have heard that it was said in those ancient times, you shall not murder, but I say unto you. And he goes and lets them have it. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you that anyone that looks with woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery. You have heard that it was said, to abide by your oaths, but I say unto you, let your yes be yes and your no's be no. And on he goes, preaching the message. Oh, my goodness. And there's a lot to unpack here in a little bit of time. Jesus, this holiness preacher, has shown up on top of a mountain, and he's letting them have it. I want to thank Annie, bless her heart, who started this uh, part of this series within the series so well. And by the way, I don't know if Annie's in this service or in the Family Life Center, okay, but um, any youth minister that starts out by saying, you know, I really like true crime podcasts, Parents, you better count your children when they get home. I mean, I don't know. But she brought it, and I'm thankful that she brought it. See, this section of the Sermon on the Mount is called the Six Antitheses. That's what the scholars call it. The Six Antitheses. Basically, you have heard that it was said, and Jesus quotes the Old Testament. He's quoting from Exodus. He's quoting from Leviticus. He's quoting from Deuteronomy. You have heard that it was said. And then he says, but I say unto you. So he's not dismissing it. <laughs> he's digging deeper. He's asking us to take this with the seriousness of which God takes it. To actually take it to the next level. Other scholars will, will also point out what's called the transformative initiative. I'm sparing you the slides. The transformative initiative, and basically is that, well, when you read the law and abide by the law, it's still a circuit, right? Okay, you break the law, you make amends, but you're going to keep circling back and forth, and the system or the cycle keeps repeating itself. When Jesus says, but I say unto you, he's asking us to break the cycle. Break the system. Be a, in the 21st century language, a disruptor for all of us. So let's dig a little bit deeper here. Consider the section on oaths that you'll find uh, in uh, verses uh, 33 and following. You've heard that it said in ancient time, you shall not swear falsely. But carry out your vows that you have made unto the Lord, but I say unto you, and he goes on to unpack that, ending with let your yes be yes and your no be no. I grew up with my grandmother reminding us, in fact, sternly telling us, don't say the phrase, I swear. You ever, any of y'all ever grown up like, don't say, I swear. I never really was real sure what, how she was contextualizing that. Was that from this? Was it from something else? Doesn't matter. We didn't swear, figuratively or otherwise, you know. 
So Jesus is reminding the hearers that, well, you know your Bibles, you know your Old Testament, how there's laws about, you know, you can make certain oaths uh, with the altar, and if it's the gold of the altar, it counts uh, one way. If it's just the altar itself, uh, well, it's a little bit more fluid. If you swear by God's name, that carries a little bit more credibility. In other words, everything is flexible. It's contextualized. Your word is not really your word, right? It depends but Jesus says, I say unto you, let your word be consistent. Kind of makes sense. Your yes be yes and your no be no. Pauses. I want to just pause here and just ask us all to reflect on, well, how good's your word? Well, seriously, how good is your word? Do you flatter? Do you puff up? Do you criticize do you gossip do you denigrate do you mean what you say and say what you mean to do, do you encourage do you belittle do you berate do you say too little or do you say too much how good's your word and, 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 then, and, and then we have this holiness preacher who reminds us he's not finished yet. So here I'm going to ask if they pull the scripture reading at verse 38. And so, so Jesus, this, this preacher, and I can just see him. I can just see him, that wild, woolly beard and, and the, 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 the outer garment just flopping in the wind, so to speak. And, and let's just be real here. If he's a true holiness preacher, heavens, if he's a true preacher, he's got a little spittle on the side of his mouth and he's, he's about to let him have it. He says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And, any, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. My goodness, friends. This preaching is nutty. I know why my father was suspicious of holiness preachers. Now, I'm not making fun. We're listening to it, right? Let's kind of dive into this for just a moment. He's, he's giving us this sermon, grinning like a possum-eating persimmons here, and he talks about turning the other cheek. Let's just stay with that for a moment. Now, I'll give you a little bit more background about me. I'm a gentle guy. I, I really am. I mean, all the way along growing up, I didn't get into scuffles that much and, um, you know, maybe with my brothers and things like that. But really, I'm a lover, not a fighter, you know, and, and, and that's still true. So I, I kind of think about this phrase, turn the other cheek, and I don't quite know what to make of it because it doesn't feel like it applies. Now, I want to caution and at least say this really clearly. I do not think Jesus is addressing the abused versus the abuser here. But there is something about what does it mean to receive and transform what someone seeking, when someone is seeking to displace you? Turn the other cheek. As we think about this further, it's not so much a, an illustration of physical violence. This is about slapping, right? And slapping is about shame. It's about insult. It's about embarrassment. And Jesus is inviting the hearer here to, to reconsider what might be happening there. Now, here again, as I think about the earlier passage on oaths, are you seeing the connection with words? You seeing how in this sermon there's actually that thread that keeps moving its way? Jesus says, on one hand, let your yes be yes and your no be no. In other words, be good to your word. And then here, turn the other cheek. And I, I can't help but think that there's a word here. What am I doing with my words that may not be physically violent? 
but most certainly can be very brutal. So for me, my weakness, my, and I think we have to call it my sin, is my rejoinders are often sarcasm. And I notice this more with my adult sons. Now, I'll laugh at them because I think, oh, they're so funny. They got that from their dad. <laughs> but then I think a little bit more and go, you know, sarcasm is really just a way of speaking meanly but being a little humorous about it, like it gives you a pass. What about it? For you, for your life, how do you hear turn the other cheek there? Is it the words of demeaning? Are they sarcasm? Is it, is it condescending? Do I need to have a sermon on social media? Twitter is rough territory. <laughs> and it's kind of my job to be on social media but increasingly, I don't like it. I like to brag about my children and my grandchild. I like to kind of talk about the fun, fuzzy stuff in life. I like to talk about church and going to it and coming from it. But uh, there's a lot I see on there that I don't think they've read the Sermon on the Mount. But that's also true for me personally as well. So as long as I'm reflecting, what, what's up about being sued here? I'm not going to ask a show of hands. Any lawyers, though? You know? Um, it's interesting that, um, I won't go into the legal system that we have today, but it's, it's, it makes often victims on both sides. I, I think about uh, years ago, I was a pastor of a congregation, and one of our senior adult members fell in the parking lot, experienced a, a small injury, and and the only way her insurance company would settle the medical costs is they needed to sue the church. It was kind of an awful predicament that she was being placed in. And so, so what, what's all this language here uh, about going a little bit extra? Well, the, the Old Testament law was in place to actually to protect, saying they can take your outer garment, but they can't take your inner garment. See, there's actually compassion throughout the Old Testament about not further victimizing the other here, but, but, but Jesus said, surprise them with radical generosity. Allow that to soak in for just a moment. Radical generosity? He spoke about going the extra mile. Now, uh, no one's ever made me go an extra mile. And in Jesus' day, the Roman soldiers could demand upon the, uh, the Jewish population to take their gear, their equipment, up to a mile, but no more. And Jesus said, well, go an extra mile. Surprise them, which would be indeed surprising. We were visiting, um, actually got to see both my sons this weekend, different zip codes, but I got to see them in the course of the weekend. Our youngest is in the Army at Fort Bragg. He got up very early Saturday morning to do an early hike, getting ready for his, uh, his PT test. And so he took his gear bag, and it was twice the weight it was supposed to be. He went hiking twice the amount he was supposed to. Now, he wasn't giving that to the Army. Don't, don't mistake that. Rather, he was saying, I, I need to get ready for this fitness test. I can assure you though he has little desire to give any more than what's being asked of him i understand that i get that but what jesus is saying is what if you lived your life in such a way that you surprise everybody by going a little bit further how would that transform your family life i mean you know i know that for me i feel like when i've emptied the dishwasher i've done a week's worth of work I'm a hero, right? But, but seriously, what would it look like if you did even more? And what is expected? For those of you in the working world, I'm not uh, asking or expecting workaholism, but, but what if you gave a little bit more with your colleagues, gave a little bit more than what's expected in terms of the product or whatever it is? What would that look like do you just know do you just do what's required of you what about in church all right let's kind of bring this together finally giving to everyone who asks 
This part kind of troubles me, well, as if the others didn't. Giving to everyone who asks. Every day during the week when I go to work, Mercer's campus, as most of y'all know, the Atlanta campus is located just inside 285 and 85. So when you take the 85 exit, there's a Shambly Tucker uh, exit. And every, Paul, am I right? Every single day, there are people there holding signs. Every single day. I mean, practically speaking, there's no way I could give. Even if it was just a dollar every time, I'd have to have a, a trunk full of dollars there. It's just, it feels overwhelming and impossible. And I know that we can sometimes hide behind the charities or the, uh, uh, or the mission gifts of the church and say, well, I give at church. And so that's how we distribute this in a more uh, polished manner, in a more uh, uh, ex- expected way, our institutionalized way of doing generosity. But but it is still troubling. What does it mean to live a life in which you're giving yourself away? So what I have tried to do is I've tried to just slow down enough. I've tried to make eye contact. Sometimes I do give, by the way. Sometimes I don't give, but I'm going to give dignity in whatever small way I can do this. I've even tried practicing this in the last few weeks. We have a lot of construction on campus, and we're looking at this beautiful building. It's No, it's not the School of Theology, but anyway, we're looking at this beautiful building that Mercer is building on campus, and it's gorgeous there. And, and, and uh, you know, we thank the architects. We thank the people that have contributed to make this happen. But there's a lot of construction workers that take up our spaces so what I've started doing now is when I park my car and I run into a construction worker, I make sure they know, hey, that's a, that's a great job y'all are doing. That looks really beautiful. We're excited about this building and can't wait to move into it. How's it been? It's amazing how they light up and just want to talk. Jesus invites us to, to give to everyone who's asking. And the, here's the trick is some people are asking and we don't even know it. They just want a little bit of our time, a little bit of our attention. All right, let's, let's kind of bring all of this up into the, to the title itself. This, this holiness preacher, this holiness preacher here in this section of the Sermon on the Mount is calling us to be holy, plain and simple. And I recognize that holiness has hidden behind stained glass for far too long. Let's, let's unpack what I mean by that. Uh, I read a novel just a few years ago that it wasn't a faith-based novel at all, but it had this line that I've hung on to for just the right opportunity. Today's just the right opportunity. And the line goes, the problem with Christianity is that it's never really been tried. I think he's right. The problem with Christianity is that it's never really been tried. And Jesus is saying, try it. It may change things. We want to be admirers, but not necessarily followers. We want to argue about posting the Ten Commandments in courthouses and the nativity scenes in the courthouse squares, but the Sermon on the Mount, nobody's arguing for that. Jesus beckons us to follow up and beyond the holy mountain, the holy mountain, to attend to all of life, even the smallest details. Let me illustrate. Years ago, um, on, on or around New Year's Day, I made this kind of a resolution. I love to do resolutions. Uh, there are there are resolution people and there are non-resolution people. I'm not going to judge you, but for me, it's kind of like a Yom Kippur for the rest of us. It's a way for me to reflect and go, all right, here's how I've messed up in the past, and here's what I want to do better. You know, so I want to resolve to do better. So this particular year wasn't so much about well, I've messed up here, but I thought I want to take yoga. And you hear all about yoga, and I don't know much about it. And so I was talking with my wife about this, Amy, and and she said, well, I'll take it with you. And I'm glad she did because this, this is true comment here. Uh, we, the yoga class we chose was on a Friday morning. And week after week after week, I am the only guy in that class. Now, I don't have a problem with being the only guy, but in yoga, it can be uncomfortable, right? So I'm just kind of glad I got my wife with me there, you know. So, uh, uh, but I, I, 
I loved our teacher, and I loved taking this for the years that we took it. In yoga, they begin with just asking you to pay attention to the ground you're standing on. It sounds simple, but just pay attention where your feet are. And then pay attention to your breathing. Now, I know you musicians, you vocalists, y'all know all about breathing, right? But, I, you know, I've never really thought much about breathing. You know, in, in the nose and out the mouth, right? Just pay attention. And in the course of that hour, each week, it was being attentive to every movement. And in that one hour, it would almost, almost guide the rest of my week physically. I found myself standing a little straighter, breathing a little better, being attentive to how I was moving about in the office, in the church, or wherever. Holiness is like that. Holiness is taking in that everything we do is being attentive, watching. It is attending to the, to the mind because out of our thoughts, actions are materialized. Paying attention to our heart because how we feel often informs the mind. Paying attention to what we say because our words matter. Paying attention to the one near us, beside us. Paying attention. Because here's the thing. That's exactly how God relates with us. Attending to us in the large and small ways. We don't want to worship a God that won't go the extra mile for us. You just let us in music about that. God is with us all the way, not just up to a limit. We certainly don't want to worship a God whose love is conditional. My goodness, we'd all be toast, literally. <laughs> As God attends to us, Jesus invites us to attend to others. And the really cool thing about all of this is it starts right now. I mean, in a few moments, we're going to have the invitation and the benediction, and we'll go out singing, and we'll have a chance to practice this with our neighbors here, maybe in the parking lot, most certainly during this week. I, I know I've gone over this quick. I knew when Sean and I discussed this series, I thought there's no way you can just unpack this. We need Wednesday nights. We need, you know, uh, study time and things like that. But, but I hope you get the gist. And in case you forget, just think about that holiness preacher who's quite serious. You've heard it said. You know what the Bible says. But I say to you, do better. Do better. So as our pastors come and prepare to receive decisions made this morning, Pastor Rhonda Open us up by reminding us, you may be a guest in this congregation, but thinking, you know, it's summertime, but this is the church home for me. <laughs> I've only been here a few weeks, and I can tell you this is a, a wonderful family of which you can trust your faith formation in. And if God is nudging, leading you, one of these pastors will be happy to talk with you about what that will look like. Maybe you need somebody to pray with you. You've got a tough week ahead, and you're wondering how you're going to make it through uh, again. These pastors are delighted to hold your hand, speak a word of encouragement. But maybe the response you need isn't down an aisle, but beyond the doors of the church. I know I talk fast. It's okay if you need to go back and read Matthew 5, 21 through 42. There's a lot of good stuff there. And if you want to unpack it further, I delight in a conversation with you. But however God is speaking, let's discern how God is leading. Let us pray. God, as we prepare to sing ourselves out of here, may our words also sing ourselves into your waiting world. People who are longing for a steadfast word. People 
who are leaning into encouragement and love, people who need to know that they matter, they count, people just like us who are hoping to discover something holy in their mundane lives. Speak into us, Lord. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you his peace. Let us stand together and let us sing together.